and he's awake since then. That's good way to put it. That's nice way to put it. That's nice way to put it. That's nice way to put it. So like I said, it's a good problem to have when you have a, such a house full. So any of you, if there is a, if there is a, like I said, if there is a, a parking problem or a space problem, it's a good problem. Just like I said, this good problem is back to us. So it's a good problem. It inspired me to buy a bigger
seated comfortably and uh, if you are right then let us look at a nice verse from the 10th canto um, the verse is in the 10th canto chapter 16 text number 30 Manmay Prabhu, Prabhu are you comfortable yeah i'm comfortable just need to it's okay, I'll just chant and you hear. Tachitra, Tachitra, Tandava, Tandava, Virupna, Virupna, Fanasahasro, Fanasahasro, Raktam Mukai, Raktam Mukai, Uruvaman. Nripa Bhagna Ghatraha Smritva Charachara Purum Purusham 
ಪುರುಷಂ ಪುರಾಣ ಮನಸ ಜಗಾಮ ಚಿತ್ರಾಂಡವ ಚಿತ್ರಾಂಡವಿರುಗ್ನಸಹಸ್ರೋಸ್ರೋಕ್ತಗಾತ್ರ ಸ್ಮೃತ್ ಚರಾಚರ ಗುರು ಪುರುಷಂ ಪುರಾಣ ಮನಸ ಜಗಾಮ ಚಿತ್ರಾಂಡವ ವಿರುಗ್ನಸಹಸ್ರೋಕ್ತಿ ಮುಖೈಮನ್ ನೃಪಭಗ್ನಗಾತ್ರ ಸ್ಮೃತ್ ಚರಾಚರ ಗುರು ಪುರುಷಂ ಪುರಾಣ ಮನಸ ಜಗಾಮ or please repeat the synonyms tat of him of him chitra chitra amazing amazing tandava tandava by the powerful dancing by the powerful dancing virugna virugna broken broken fana sahasraha fana sahasraha is 1000 hoods is 1000 hoods raktam raktam blood blood mukhai mukhai from his mouth from his mouth guru guru profusely profusely vaman vomiting vomiting nripa nripa okin pariksha okin pariksha bhagna gatra bhagna gatra is limbs crushed is limbs crushed smritva smritva remembering remembering chara achara chara achara of all moving of all moving and non moving beings and non moving beings guru the spiritual master the spiritual master usham Purusha. the personality of godhead the personality of godhead puranam puranam ancient ancient narayanam narayanam lord narayana lord narayana tam tam to him aranam aranam for shelter for shelter manasa manasa within his mind within his mind jagama jagama he approached he approached translation please repeat the translation My dear King Parikshit My dear King Parikshit Lord Krishna's Lord Krishna's wonderful wonderful powerful powerful dancing dancing trampled trampled and broke and broke all of Kaliya's 1000 hoods all of Kaliya's 1000 hoods then then the serpent the serpent profusely vomiting blood profusely vomiting blood from his mouth from his mouth finally recognized finally recognized Sri Krishna Sri Krishna to be the eternal personality of godhead to be the eternal personality of godhead the supreme master the supreme master of all moving all moving and non moving beings and non moving shri narayana shri narayana thus within his mind within his mind kaliya kaliya took shelter of the lord took shelter of the lord please hear the purport in volume 1 chapter 16 of krishna the supreme personality of godhead Srila Prabhupada points out that whereas previously Kaliya was vomiting poison, now his poison was exhausted and he began to vomit blood. Thus he had been cleansed of the vile contamination within his heart that had manifested as serpent's venom. The word smritva, remembering, is very significant here. The wives of Kaliya were actually serious devotees of Lord Krishna. and according to the acharyas they had often tried to convince their husband to surrender to him finally finding himself in unbearable agony kaliya remembered his wife's advice and took shelter of the lord srila vishwanath chakravarti thakur explains that kaliya's arch rival had traditionally been garuda the carrier of vishnu but now kaliya realized that he was fighting an opponent who was thousands of times stronger than garuda and who therefore could be only the supreme personality of godhead 
Thus, Kaliya took shelter of Lord Krishna. Jai. O Magdhyana Timidandasya Jnana Jashadaya Chakshurumiritam Yena Prasmai Shri Vena Shri Chaitanya Nomirisham Sapitamyena Bhutale is Krishna chastises the servant Kaliya. This entire chapter is very nicely put into Krishna book by Srila Prabhupada. And the notes that I have from this chapter is actually taken um, from, from a very informal lecture that uh, my Guru Maharaj gave in Rajkot, maybe in 2009. The pastime of Kaliya is very important for devotees. In fact, all pastimes of Krishna they are actually steeped in all the principles of Bhagavatam. So we should not take the pastimes of Krishna on a sentimental level. Sometimes we read of them as stories, but because we lack the faith to understand that they actually happened and they occurred, and that the deep meaning and the significance of the pastimes actually apply practically to our daily lives. Kaliya's pastime with Krishna is very unique in, in the pastimes of Krishna. Because all the demons actually Krishna killed. But somehow in another Kaliya, he only chastised. If you find it's very interesting, Kaliya actually is the, one of the rare, rare demons whom Krishna came across and actually allowed to, to, to live alive, you know. Yeah. That doesn't mean every, every time you come to Krishna, you die. But it also means that there is a reason why Kaliya was allowed uh, to continue with his existence. So that's why this pastime is very important to us. Because what Kaliya learned from Krishna and what Krishna is teaching us is very important. The verse also particularly in this, in this particular chapter is also very important. Because here, um, Shukadev Goswami is explaining to Parikshit Maharaj. And he says, my dear King Parikshit, Lord Krishna's wonderful and powerful dancing. So Krishna actually danced on the wood of Kaliya. And his dancing is very wonderful. It is also very powerful. And it was so powerful that all the hoods of Kaliya, which were 1,000, they actually broke under the force of the feet of Krishna. And when Kaliya started vomiting blood, whereas previously he was spewing out poison, then something changed in Kaliya. And the verse tells us that the moment he started profusing vomit vomiting blood from his mouth, that is the moment when Kaliya's consciousness changes. So there is a link between what he vomited after uh, he was touched by Krishna 
and how his consciousness changed upon being touched by Krishna. And the moment that junction of his life changed, then something happened in his consciousness and within his mind, he took shelter of Krishna. And that is very difficult for a living entity who is envious by nature, like, um, like Kaliya was. So it's very important and practical verse. And in the purport, Prabhupada is quoted here very nicely from Krishna book that whereas previously Kaliya was vomiting poison, now whatever poison he had in his body <coughs> he was exhausted. And with the exhausting of the poison, his heart also, whatever contamination there was in the heart, that was also exhausted. And that is why now blood began to come out. And this change from poison to blood was actually purificatory for him. It signaled actually a change in his consciousness. And the word that is used here, Smritva, is remembering. So actually, while he was being trampled, Kaliya was actually in intense remembrance of Krishna. Because he was wondering, who is this so powerful Krishna? Garuda is so powerful, but I could fight him at least. But this person, you know, he's so powerful, I can't do anything. So because he kept remembering and remembering and remembering Krishna, that remembrance turned whatever poison he had in himself, it turned it into blood. And in, in doing so, it exhausted all his impious activities and the results of his sinful reactions. They were all exhausted just by being touched by Krishna. And when that happens here, we find that actually Kaliya then started having a change of his mind. And he remembered his wives, because his wives, the Nagapatnis, they were actually great devotees of Krishna. You know, sometimes in devotional service, these things happen. When one spouse becomes a great devotee, the other spouse becomes totally the opposite. <laughs> and for a long time, you know, there is big Mahabharata in the, war, in the house. So like that also, there was Mahabharata in his house. Nagapatnis were all devotees of Krishna, but Kaliya was anything but that. So this is the context of the verse. But to really appreciate how Kaliya comes to this point, it's very important for us to understand his entire pastime. So here we find that actually Kaliya was not a resident of Yamuna Lake. He was actually a resident of a place called Nagalaya. It is a place where all the Nagas and the serpents were staying. And there Kaliya was also one of the big serpents, you know, and he was one of the chiefs there. The entire Nagalaya was actually ruled by Vasuki. And you know Vasuki figures in Nagatam <coughs> pastimes very much. He's the chief of all the snakes. But Kaliya was a strong warlord, so to speak. Now there in Nagalaya, all the serpents were there. Now the serpents were the natural food of Garuda. Garuda is the great devotee of Krishna. But he had, because he was also in the form of a bird, it was a natural propensity of Garuda to actually feast on snakes. So whatever happened, Nagalaya was always troubled by Garuda, so to speak. Until Vasuki decided, let's negotiate. <laughs> Instead of everyone being killed all the time, you have your food, it is part of our ecological chain, I understand that. Why don't we decide that we will have one snake coming up and being given to you and you don't disturb everyone else. We will put that snake under a tree, you come, you take the snake and you go. So Garuda agreed. So what happened was when Garuda was sticking to his part of the deal, Kaliya became envious of Garuda. And Kaliya thought, why should that snake be eaten by Garuda? So instead of the snake being eaten by Garuda, this Kaliya, he took the snake for himself. So Kaliya was not only eating other kinds of things, he was also eating his own kind. And also he was very envious of Garuda, because he was thinking why we should bow before Garuda. Who is Garuda? So he could not understand that Garuda is actually very dear to Krishna. And therefore in his heart he was actually offensive towards Garuda. So what happened was he started taking that which was not part of his quota. And this is where all our problems start in the spiritual life. As devotees, the first thing we should understand is, we all have a quota. And, it is, it, and that quota is given to us in life by the grace of Krishna. Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam. Krishna is actually the proprietor of everything. He is also the proprietor of whatever we have. When we came into this world, we had nothing with us. Yet by His mercy, we acquire so many things in this life. But if we ever mistakenly think that this thing becomes my property, then that, that mistaken thinking actually becomes a source of great distress for us. So Kaliya, he was actually well settled. He had nice wives known as Nagapatnis. He had many children, little Kaliyas. 
So his family situation was very nice. There was no need for him to go outside of what he had. But the problem with the living entities is, when we are not connected to Krishna, it is very hard for us to be satisfied with whatever comes. And self-satisfaction is a dream in this material world. Because every time we have something, the idea is we look at someone else's thing. And the moment we see someone else's acquisition, we think in our heart that what belongs to him should also belong to me. And in that way, our envy of other people grows. And when we can't get that which belongs to someone else, then what happens is we become angry and envious of that person. And that is the nature of a snake. A snake is always envious and therefore he's always angry. So Kali exhibited that actually. If you read today's diary, or rather calendar of Guru Maharaj, you'll find, I think he says, you know, very nicely, the same point. Seeing the other palaces, we should not burn our hut. <laughs> it's a very nice point. Looking at other people's palaces, why we have to burn our hut? What is wrong with our hut? And he says we should be completely satisfied in our own situation. The start of the end of Kaliya was only because of this. That he started thinking that those things I should take. So he had the grabbing tendency, you know, pinching, pinching. So that which was meant for the devotee should be offered to the devotee. Kaliya was not lacking anything, but his mind was disturbing him. So he grabbed the snakes. Now Garuda decided this is not correct. And Garuda then decided to punish him. But Kaliya fought against Garuda. But how can one fight against the devotee of the Lord? Garuda is so powerful that Kaliya realized, oh, I'm in trouble. So he had to flee from, Ka from Garuda. So he took his whole bunch. The whole family had to leave because of his greed. You know? And this is how, because we are not satisfied, we disturb not only ourselves, but even those who depend on us. That is why self-satisfaction is a very important quality of a devotee. Whatever comes, we should be grateful for what it comes. When we are not satisfied, actually we are never grateful. We don't realize there is a very deep connection between being grateful for what we have and therefore being positive about what comes to us, as opposed to always hankering and hankering and never being grateful for what has already been given to us. This ingratitude kills us. You know? As parents, we, we become disturbed when our, uh, when our children just take us for granted, when they are not grateful for all the things we have done. So how much more grateful we should be to our Supreme Parent, that whatever that we have today is really because of His mercy. So Kaliya's lack of gratitude put him into trouble, and he had to leave Nagalia. But he never learned his lesson. So he left there, and he came to the lake, which was within the lake of Yamuna. Within this great river Yamuna, there was a lake, and it was flowing. And in that lake, yeah, uh, Kaliya decided to settle down. Now there was a reason why he came to Lake Yamuna. Because in Lake Yamuna previously, there was a Muni known as Saubri Muni. And he was sitting down and doing penance in the water. And while he was doing penance in the water, he developed an attachment for the fishes. Now Saubri Muni is a very nice, interesting case. He left the entire land so that he would not be attached to anything on land. He thought, if I go deep into the waters, I'll be free of attachment. And therefore, when I'm free of attachment, what happens? I'll then be able to concentrate on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But instead of concentrating on Krishna, he went very deep into the water and he was surrounded by fishes. So after years of being surrounded by fishes, he became attached to them. So after leaving everything on land, he developed the same attachment in water. And that's also a very important point for us. It's not where we are that matters. It's what kind of consciousness we have that matters. We can be seated here, but our mind could be at home. What is the point? So therefore, consciousness is everything. And that is why Krishna consciousness means to be conscious of who we are in relation to Krishna. So this point, he missed, Saubri Muni. And what happened was, Garuda used to come to the lake in Yamuna also to pick a few fishes. And Saubri Muni, being attached to the fishes, could not understand that Krishna had allowed Garuda to come here because it was his nature, he had to eat. So he had the full blessings of Krishna, but Saubri Muni thought the lake belonged to him. He thought the fishes are my property, I must defend them. So unknowingly and not even understanding his true position, he chastised Garuda and he cursed him. And he told him, the next time you come and eat at the lake, you will die. Garuda is a great devotee of the Lord. He could easily have counter-cursed and said, now I'm going to give you a curse. He could have overridden the curse easily. But devotees of the Lord, they are tolerant. 
Devotees of the Lord see curses and adversities as the hand of Krishna. So Garuda was humble. He thought this Muni has cursed me. Well, I have to respect him. Therefore, I will not come to Yamuna Lake and I will not do anything there. So what happens then? So now only person who knew about the fact that Garuda would never come to Yamuna Lake happened to be Kalia. He had a good network of communication. <laughs> <laughs> so he heard here, heard there, he understood. Ah, so he won't come here. I got the tip off, you know, from Sauberi. So what happened was, he decided that he would go to Yamuna River. And there he became the king of the lake. Because no one could disturb him. And when you think that something belongs to you that actually doesn't belong to you, you become unnecessarily puffed up. So his poison increased. When you think that you are puffed up, actually we actually poison our body. Because we don't realize that with pride comes envy. And with envy comes anger. And whenever we are angry with someone, that person is actually very free. He sleeps very well. <laughs> but the person who is angry with that person, he cannot sleep. We lose so much of our health being angry with someone. But the person who is being angered, or the subject of the anger, he is free of it. Because he is very peaceful. So Kalia had so much poison because of his envy and anger. And the poison eventually corrupted the lake. It corrupted the lake to such a point that Bhagavatam tells us if a bird were to fly across the lake, just the vapors of the poison would render it dead. It would just die. Can you imagine? If the wind were to pick up any of the sprays of the lake, you know, the vapors of the lake that came out and carried it over a distance to the ground, and if cows or anyone were to feed on that, they would die also. That was how dangerous it was. So Krishna one day was with the boys, you know, the cowherd boys, and they were by the river Yamuna. Yamuna was very dear to Krishna, and they were playing there. Suddenly the boys and the cows, they just took some grass and fruits that they were around that area, and the moment they took it, the poison infected them. And they fell unconscious, Bhagavatam says, almost to the point of death. In fact, some of them had left their life, their bodies also. When Krishna saw that this is the effect of the poison of Kalia in the lake, he decided something had to be done. So just by his merciful glance, Bhagavatam tells us, he just looked at his cowherd boys, he looked at all the cows, and they revived. And this is the greatness of Krishna. The moment we take darshan of Krishna, or when Krishna is so merciful, he gives us darshan. That day when we get darshan, that day only we are alive. This is a very important point from Bhagavatam. In the fourth canto, ninth chapter, sixth verse, Dhruva Maharaj, you know, was a young boy, maybe about your age only. And he wanted to get a kingdom bigger and better than his father. So he goes into the forest and he remembers Krishna by getting instructions from Narada Muni. And after a long time of meditation with great determination, Krishna appears before him. But when Krishna appears before him, he doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know how to glorify Krishna. He's thunderstruck. So his mouth, everything is dead. You know? So Krishna just takes the conch shell and he touches the shoulder, just the shoulder of Dhruva Maharaj. And the moment Dhruva Maharaj is touched by Krishna, because the conch shell of Krishna is not different from Krishna, immediately he comes alive. Yunta pravishya mama vacha mimam prasutta Sanji vayati akila sati daraswadhamna Anyams chahasta sharana shravana twagadim Pranams namo bhagavate purushayatu bhyam. It's a very important verse from Bhagavatam because there Dhru Maharaj now gives us the understanding of what happens when we are touched by Krishna. Brahma sparshana. He says that, my Lord, until I was touched by you today, I was actually dead. My life, pran, my skin, my organs, my senses, even the sense of my speech and my tongue, they had no value. I was like a zombie. You know, you all know zombies, isn't it? Zombie is now very current, isn't it? Everywhere. Right? So zombie, long time before that, Bhagavatam speaks of zombies already. Right? Because when you don't have Krishna in your life, you are walking, but you are dead. So that qualifies you as zombie. So therefore, until we come to devotional service, until we are touched by Krishna, it is very difficult to have meaning in life. And that is what happened to him. His senses had no value until they were used for Krishna. So therefore, that proves to us that all Shakti, all power, all opulence, everything comes when we are connected to Krishna. So this is what happened. And that is why the boys, because their lives were only about Krishna. The Gopas and the Gopis in Vrindavan, 
they had no one else except Krishna. What is that verse? Tava katha amritam, tapta jivanam, kavi viditam, kalma sampaham, shravana mangadam, shri maratatam, bhuvi granantiye, buridhajana. It's a beautiful verse. The gopis sing, you know, in their song of separation. They say that this katha of Krishna, that's what we're doing. Anything related to Krishna is amrit. Tava katha amritam, tapta jivanam, it is the life of all those who have no life. It is the life of all the devotees. So Krishna is the reason why we are alive. There is no other reason. For the residents of Vrindavan, they had nothing in their life except Krishna. And that is why by nature they were simple. They did not complicate their lives by thinking, I have Krishna, but will he help me, will he not? Because he had, they had full faith. Krishna means Krishna is there. We don't have to worry. Just by the merciful glance of the Lord, on the strength of their faith on Him, they all were revived. So now Krishna decided, let me now tackle Kaliya. So Bhagavatam says, you know, like a fighter about to fight, Krishna titled, he, he, like he tightened his, you know, you know, sometimes you have this armband on your, on your shoulder. Some people have that, you know. So sometimes wrestlers used to have that. So Krishna tightened the armbands around him. He tightened his, you know, dhoti just to make sure it's all well ready. <laughs> and then he climbed on that beautiful Kadambakarna tree. You know, Kadambakarna tree, if you go to Vrindavan, that tree is still there. All other trees along the river Yamuna, they all had died because of, of uh, Kaliya. But this tree, this tree was saved by Krishna. And Sastras tell us also that actually, uh, actually this tree was touched by the nectar of Garuda whenever he came to eat in the lake of Yamuna. And that's why this tree was never touched by the poison of Kaliya. In other words, whenever we have association of devotees, that association of devotees is as good as the association of the Lord. It saves us from the cycle of birth and death. And that is why that Kadamakarna tree was alive. It was ready to do service for Krishna. And Krishna climbed on it and then he jumped into the lake. And Bhagavatam tells us his jumping into the lake was itself an amazing event. Because the moment he jumped into a lake, he's a small boy. If you jump into a big lake, nothing happens, just a splash and you go in. But when Krishna jumped in, the entire waters of the Yamuna, they were displaced. They came out like waves, surges of waves coming onto the shores. Because that shows us that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's heavier than the heaviest. Therefore, he's supreme. So he jumps deep into the water and he tries to find Kaliya. But it doesn't take long for Krishna to be attracted or rather for Kaliya to be attracted to Krishna. Because when Krishna goes in, what he does is he starts to beat the waters. He creates disturbance in the waters, hoping it will attract Kaliya. Kaliya comes out and thinks, I am the king of this lake. Who is that person disturbing the lake? Now the moment Kaliya takes darshan of Krishna, in the beginning Bhagavatam tells us, He's very attracted to Krishna. Can you imagine? Even a snake as envious as Kaliya, when he looked at Krishna, he thought, who is this nonsense? But he thought, hey, but he looks very nice. <laughs> he admired him. He said, oh, this boy looks nice. He has nice dhoti, nice bluish color. You know, It's very beautiful. So for a while, Kaliya forgot his anger. He forgot his, his, um, his envy. This shows us the greatness of Krishna. That actually, even no matter how demonic we may be, Factually speaking, we are all attracted by Krishna. Factually speaking, we are actually all attracted by Krishna. It is just the dirt, you know, that covers our heart. And therefore, we can't see that actually Krishna is very beautiful. That's why Rupa Goswami says in Nectar Devotion very beautifully, Smeram Bhangitraya Parichitam Sachi Vishtirna Drishtim Vamsi nyasta adara kilashnaya Ujvala chandrakena Govindam makyam hari tanumitaha Keshi tirta upakante Ma prekshita stavayadi sakhi Bandhu sange asti ranga Prabhupada chanted this verse, actually, very lovingly. You read about it in his, um, when he takes darshan of the deities, in one of the temples, he chanted this verse. 
it's in Leela Amrita actually. And it's actually found in the Nectar of Devotion. And actually, it is quoted by Mahaprabhu also in Chaitanya Charita Amrita. And you all have heard of this term reverse psychology, isn't it? Reverse psychology means I tell you, don't come for the program, don't come for the program. If nothing is there, nothing is there. Then what happens is you start thinking, maybe I should come for the program. <laughs> you know, people are like that, you know. If you tell them, don't do it, don't do it, they want to do it. So sometimes, you know, we use reverse psychology, especially on children, isn't it? We tell them, no, 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 don't do this, don't do this. But that's when they will do it. You know that. So that's how we are also. So the father of reverse psychology is actually Rupa Goswami. Long before our new age psychologist started using reverse psychology, he uses it in Nectar of Devotion. Because he says in this verse, my dear friend, he's addressing all of us. He says, my dear friend, if you're very attached to your friends, your society and your family, then I have a word of advice for you. You please don't look at this boy. There is a boy who's standing by the shores of the Yamuna, near the lake, near the KC Gat. And this boy is standing in a tree-bended form. He has a beautiful flute, and when the flute touches his beautiful lips, they look like blossom twigs. And when he stands in the moonlight, he looks exceedingly beautiful. This boy has a name. His name is Govinda. Govinda Akyam Haritanum. And the beauty of him is, he stands in his three-bender form, with a beautiful flute, touching his equally, if not more beautiful lips. He stands by the shores of the Keshi Gat, and against the moonlight he appears very nice. He is three-mended, and he casts a sidelong glance. Krishna never looks at us directly. He doesn't. Because we are also very indirect with him, isn't it? We don't want to come directly to Krishna. So you find devotees also, we have this way. You know, we never come to someone and say, please come to Krishna. No, we feed his stomach with prasadam. Mm -hmm. We tell him this is very nice. It's all crooked, you know. Because Krishna is also bad. And he never looks directly. You know, if someone looks at you from side, you know he's thinking something else. So Krishna also gives you a sidelong glance. And he's smiling. So if you look at this boy with all these beautiful features, Rupa Goswami says, don't look at him. Ma prakshitas. Na in Sanskrit means no. Ma means double, double no. That means please don't look at him. Because the moment you look at this boy, who looks so beautiful with his sidelong glance, with his blossom twigs of, leaf, of, of, of his lips, with his three-bended form, standing on the shores of this Keshi Ghat, very, very beautiful in the moonlight, by the name of Govinda, who has the capacity to remove all your miseries. Don't see him. Because if you do, you will forget your friends, you'll forget your family, you'll forget your society. Like that, Rupa Goswami ends that verse. So in the same way, when Kaliya looked at Krishna, what happened was, he also had a bit of this. He did not realize that by just taking darshan of Krishna, the purification of his heart had started. Kaliya was very attached to his position. He was attached to the fact that he was king of the lake. And he, therefore he was envious of Krishna because he thought Krishna cannot be the supreme personality of Godhead. But the moment he took darshan, without even wanting to, he started becoming purified. So Krishna started fearlessly beating the lake and Kaliya thought, let me teach him something. He actually sank his fangs into the chest of Krishna. Can you imagine? Large fangs of Kaliya sank into the chest of Krishna. And then he coiled him around and he thought, I'll squeeze the life out of him. Now all this became visible to the Gopas who were on, this, on the lake. And they started swooning because they thought now Krishna is going to die. Even though they believed that Krishna was all in all, their love for him was such that they thought he was just a little boy. So in their heart they thought we are going to be separated now from Krishna. And now the word started spreading. And all the other residents of Vrindavan heard Krishna is in trouble in the lake. They thought, how are we going to live without Krishna? They could not bear the thought of living without Krishna. So they looked for the, hoof, the footprints of Krishna and they followed all the way to the lake. Next, we hear that Nanda Maharaj and the cowherd men, they also heard that now Krishna is in trouble. And they, be, be, they became more troubled because they saw Balram was not with Krishna at that time. They always thought elder brother Balram is very strong. He will take care of younger brother Krishna. So they were all in a state of anxiety. Last person to hear was Mother Yashoda. And for Mother Yashoda, Krishna was all in all. When she heard, she ran to the lake. And when she saw that Krishna was caught by the coils and he appeared to be in trouble, Yashoda Mata fainted. 
So she fainted. All the residents of Vrindavan were swooning. Uh, Nanda Maharaj thought, maybe we should jump into the lake and try to help him. But only one person was smiling, and that was Lord Balram. Because Lord Balram knew, who is Krishna? They have no idea. He is the supreme personality of God here. I don't need to help him. He knows exactly what he's doing. But Nanda Maharaj was upset with Balram because they were very anxious and he was smiling. And they were, when they wanted to jump into the water, he told, Father, there is no need now. He will handle this uh, snake on his own. So somehow or another they heard. The cows were crying. The ladies were crying. The men were crying. The residents of Vrindavan thought, now we are going to be in separation from Krishna. But what is really nice, Prabhupada says in Krishna book is, the more they started remembering Krishna, it translated into the more they started now remembering all the pastimes of Krishna. When they knew or thought that Krishna was in trouble, how did they remember him? They started remembering his pastime. You know, Krishna did this that day. You know, Krishna did that the other day. And they started discussing amongst each other about the pastime of Krishna. In the height of their grief, they found solace in remembering his pastimes. And that is such an important message for us. Whenever material nature brings us down, we will find true happiness and peace by trying to discuss the beautiful activities of Krishna. We must have that spiritual maturity to do that. And the more we remember Krishna's pastimes, the more we chant his names like we did today so wonderfully, the more Krishna will be framed in our hearts. Therefore, for the residents of Vrindavan, separation from Krishna was a great opportunity to heighten their remembrance of him. That's why in the verse, the word Smritva is very important. To remember Krishna is the goal of our life. Never to forget him is a negative way of saying we should always remember him. But it means we should never ever forget Krishna. The residents of Vrindavan showed us that. In good times, they remembered Krishna's pastimes. In bad times, they didn't say, what is happening with Krishna? They didn't curse Krishna. They didn't forget his greatness. They remember his greatness through his activities. Now for two hours, Prabhupada writes in Krishna book, Prabhupada actually gives us a time range. It's very interesting because in the eternal world there is no time. But when you read Krishna book, Prabhupada specifically says, this whole battle with Kaliya lasted about two hours. Okay? Two hours definitely of Krishna's time, not your time and my time. <laughs> and Krishna, when he looked at the, at, the, at the shore and he saw, my mother has fainted, now at this rate, they will all also die. Remembering me, they will live their lives. So I think I have heightened the remembrance of the Vrindavan residents enough. <laughs> so actually, when Krishna does one particular pastime, he achieves many objectives. He's what you call the ultimate multitasker. <laughs> right? He does so many things, but he achieves many objectives with them. In material world, we multitask everywhere, but we achieve nothing. But with Krishna, he achieves everything. So Krishna apparently was fighting the Kaliya demon. But factually speaking, in his difficulty, so-called difficulty, he was increasing the bhakti of all his devotees. Only the Lord can do that. And when he found that the bhakti of his devotees pleased him very much, he thought, now enough. They shouldn't be put in so much difficulty. So now he immediately frees himself from Kaliya by expanding himself. And Kaliya now realizes, hey, what, what's happening? With all my strength, I cannot hold Krishna back. And now Kaliya is in trouble. And Krishna just breaks free of Kaliya, jumps out of the lake. And Kaliya's head, you know, is at the top. Now Kaliya has a thousand hoods. He's a big time snake. And on each hood, right, he has a jewel. Very, very precious jewel on the top of his head, like a crown. And the jewels are all reddish and very valuable. These snakes, they come from the lower regions of the subterranean planets. In those subterranean planets, there is no electricity. The sun does not reach the subterranean planets, if you look at Vedic astronomy. But the subterranean planets are as bright as Swargaloka. They are bright because of the jewels that are on the hoods of these great snakes. They are so bright that it is enough light. They don't need sunlight. So imagine how powerful Kaliya was. But Krishna did something amazing. He started jumping on the head of Kaliya. But before he did that, he started circling Kaliya in the lake. So Kaliya tried to catch him, Krishna would move away. Kaliya tried to catch him, Krishna would move away. You know, sometimes the best way to uh, vanquish your opponent is to tire him. 
if you are a boxer and you start moving around very very quickly in the in the ring your opponent tries to catch you but you dodge him then eventually your opponent will tire so krishna knew all these fighting tactics you know so what he did was he just circled kalia over and over and over and after a while kalia said i'm losing stamina now what to do with him now when krishna when krishna realized that kalia was losing strength so kalia started using the fire of poison he started emanating poison from all his mouth and the poison took the form of fire and it seemed like yamuna lake was on fire but krishna jumped through the fire and he jumped now on the head of kalia and instead of jumping jumping awkwardly krishna was the master of all arts he turned his jumping on the head of kalia into a beautiful dance so he started using the thousand heads of kalia to jump every time kalia lifted one part of the hood to try and catch krishna krishna would jump to another hood only his jump was a dance and he then choreographed an entire beautiful dance there and then and as he did that what looked like a dangerous situation became a sweet situation suddenly all the devatas you know they started passing word around because they had their network also hey krishna is starting to dance on this demon and it's a beautiful dance so any dance should be accompanied by music isn't it so suddenly when someone starts kirtan somebody brings karta somebody takes harmonium somebody brings a drum in the same way the moment they saw krishna having a rhythm and having a beautiful dance at the expense of kaliya then all the devatas the charanas the vidyadharas the gandharvas they started singing they sang in glorification of krishna they chanted his names like we have hare krishna hare krishna hare ram hare ram 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 hare and the more they did that they started bringing out all their kettle drums their mridangas they started showering flowers bhagavatam tells us every time kaliya tried to shoot off something from his hood or tried to bite krishna and krishna stamped it down again at that point the the devatas would throw some more flowers on him so it was all timed you know and nice kirtan was going on and in that way all the celestials in the heavenly planets they became so enlivened to see krishna and this is the greatness of krishna that when we have krishna in our lives that which looks like an adverse situation that that looks like a crazy situation in our lives just by the touch of krishna it can assume and bring so much bliss and peace in our lives just by dancing on the head of a demon kaliya he not only increased the remembrance and glorification of himself amongst the residents of vrindavan but he also did that for all the denizens of the three planets and the more kaliya started throwing um, fire the more krishna stamped and smashed his head and as he stamped his head bhagavatam tells us he broke the stones the beautiful rubies and when they mixed with the redness of his own lotus feet the entire scene looked very beautiful so not only was there chanting about krishna but the glorification of krishna was also in his beautiful darshan and that is what we are getting today and so when krishna did that 1000 hoods of kaliya were systematically in a beautiful dance broken by krishna and finally when the head was being broken the pride was also being broken you know sometimes when we are proud our heads are very high isn't it you know when when a proud person walks around figuratively we, we say he has a very high nose we cannot look down you know but sometimes when we get the slaps of maya after a few times then we realize hey, i'm actually looking down more these days <laughs> so kaliya had to go through that only because he was very proud of who he was but he did not realize that what is his strength if krishna doesn't want it what is our strength without krishna's grace and mercy this nothing and if demonically we think that our strength belongs to us then krishna by his mercy will cut us down to scale that actually is a great mercy of the lord but sometimes it has to be done through the slaps you know children you give them ice cream every day oh they will do arti for you but one day you stop them and say no more ice cream they will throw things at you not flowers but other things <laughs> they'll hate you they'll curse you but years later they will realize you know what this difficult thing of stopping ice cream actually helped me because my health became better so sometimes in material life when krishna gives us the slaps of maya we should remember how kaliya got the slaps he got it much more than us and this krishna is not dancing on our heads you know but the point is the same that when we think we own everything when we think that everything belongs to us 
when we think that everything is our property, when we are envious of Krishna, when we exhibit anger, then Krishna will scale us down. Now, whatever poison that was coming out was no longer poison. He was vomiting blood. And this change from blood or poison to blood is significant. It signifies that the heart of Kalya was becoming purified. We, are, we should not pray to Krishna that, Krishna, you please kick me in such a way I start vomiting blood. But we should have a change of consciousness. By how? By changing our attitude. By taking up this devotional process. It is very nicely stated in Bhagavatam, you know, that the devotional process starts very nicely. Shrunavata shraddhaya nityam Grinatas cha swa chestitam Kalena na dirgena Bhagavan vishate riddhi in 2nd Canto 8th chapter, I think 4th verse, very nicely, Shukadev Goswami gives us the formula how to change our poison to blood, how to become purified. He says there, Shranavatam, those who are always hearing, that is the starting point. Only if you hear about Krishna can you say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare, 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 Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Ram Hare, Hare, Hare. So, Bhagavatam tells us, Persons who hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly. Shravatam Shraddhaya. Shraddhaya means with earnestness. We understand Shraddhaya normally as faith. But if you read the word to word meaning, Prabhupada translates faith as earnestness. In other words, if you want to develop faith, be eager to hear about Krishna. You're all a good example. Today is a holiday. You should be sleeping in. What are you doing here? You came in the morning. The children are amazing. I haven't even heard them. It's like they don't even exist. It's amazing. No sound. So that shows that you have taken so much trouble just to come and hear Krishna. That is your eagerness. That is Shraddha. Shraddha. So Shranavatam, those who hear about Krishna and those who hear about him earnestly, they have faith. And when they are earnest about it, Nityam. Shranavatam, Shraddhaya, Nityam. Nityam Prabhupada translates very nicely. He says, persons who hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly, regularly, it's very important. And Nityam also means eternally. Eternally also means every time. This is very important. Because sometimes we, are, we like the word regular. Because we say, you know, I come and hear Bhagavatam once a year. I'm very regular. <laughs> Isn't it? I'm very constant also. I make sure I hear it but once a year. That's it. I'm very regular and very, very regulated. But here it is constant. It is nitya. So the formula to change our consciousness and purify the sinful reaction starts like this. Those who hear the message of Bhagavatam or any topics related to Krishna and Grinatascha Swachestitam and who take this subject matter very seriously by their own endeavor. Very important. You must endeavor for Krishna. There must be some effort put in for Krishna. We chanted half an hour. That is effort. It's not easy to chant. But we are chanting. Every day we put aside time for Krishna. It requires effort. But we cannot say, oh Krishna is in my heart. Oh I know Krishna, you don't have to tell me. I don't have to chant Krishna's name because he knows I love him and I love him also. Finish. But you know and I know that there is no effort. It's very easy to say I am staying at home and thinking of Golden Valley. It's very different from being in Golden Valley and thinking of Krishna. So we should not cheat ourselves. Granatascha swachestitam. There must be endeavor. So someone who endeavors seriously to hear Bhagavatam and who does it regularly, what happens? Kalena na dirgena. In no time at law at all, Bhagavatam guarantees us. Bhagavan Vishate Hriti. The Supreme Lord becomes manifest in the heart of that devotee. Amazing. In no time at all. We are very impatient by nature, you know? in this world of everything being instant. Now everything is instant, isn't it? I don't know, I mean in here so it must be in Singapore. Nowadays you can get, you can go to a store and you get instant ladu, instant kesari. You don't have to do anything, isn't it? Everything is instant. And we also want Krishna instantly. We think that if I come one day, tomorrow he has to appear. <laughs> but if that's the case, then who is Krishna and who is servant? We forget. <laughs> Krishna appears by his own sweet will. So a devotee, kalena na atidirgena. In no time Krishna is ready to appear before him. Now, when, when a devotee does that, then what happens? In the next verse, pravishta karna randrena. Very important point. Krishna, when he sees a devotee doing this, 
He comes as the sound incarnation, His holy name, Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Swanam Bhava Sarururam. Krishna comes as the sound incarnation through the ears of a devotee who is hearing about Him. And when He comes through the ears, where does He go? He doesn't go to your kidney, He doesn't go to your liver. He goes to the lotus flower of your relationship with Him. What an amazing translation Prabhupada gives. Prabhupada says the sound incarnation of the Lord enters into the heart of the self-realized devotee, sits on the lotus flower of his relationship, which is loving. Krishna sits on the lotus flower of his loving relationship. And when he does that, what happens to the devotee? The devotee experiences dhunoti shamalam krishna, right? Sarilasya yadhasharat. When Krishna is seated in the, in the heart of the living entity in this process, then he does one thing amazing. He cleanses the heart of the dust of all material association, lust, anger and hankering. And he cleans it just like autumn rains come after a long summer. And when that first autumn rain, rains come in a hot, long hot summer, how pleasing those rains are. How they clean the dust from the, from the streets. In the same way, Krishna comes into the heart of a devotee in this manner. This is what was happening to Kaliya, even though he was not devotee. He was hearing the residents of the world chanting Krishna's names. He was being touched by the lotus feet of Krishna. And even though he did not realize it, the power of bhakti is so strong that even if you resist it, it has a way of transforming your heart. This is amazing. How many of us in the beginning resisted chanting Krishna? I was number one. I could not take it. I, 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 I just couldn't. The first time I went for a program, I went, I entered the program and I thought I entered the wrong place. Because when I entered the program, all the devotees were jumping up and down in ecstasy. And they were trying to hit the ceiling. You know? And my background was, I came from a background where we all sat down and meditated silently. Imagine the culture shock. I came to this place and people were jumping like mad people. And the temple president came up to me, he didn't say anything, he just looked at me and he said, <laughs> I'm out of here. This is the first and the last time I'm leaving. This is not for me, you know. So we all resisted Krishna, just like Kaliya resisted Krishna. But how long can you resist him? It's very hard. Once the prasadam comes in, it's more difficult to resist. <laughs> it's very difficult. Very difficult. So this is the greatness of Krishna. That he himself sits in the heart and he started cleansing the heart of Kaliya. So that all the poison now was transformed into blood. It was good for him. And when that happens, Dautatma Purushaha Krishna Pada Mulam Na Munchati Mukta Sarva Pariklesha Pantaha Swa Sharanam Yataha a devotee of the Lord whose heart has been cleansed that way, what happens to him? He is never, he never leaves the lotus feet of the Lord. And that's what happened to Kaliya. Kaliya was forced not to leave the lotus feet of the Lord because it was on his head. So he was very, very happy. And when that happened, what happened to Kaliya? Kaliya now started becoming purified. And as the verse tells us here, he now began to recognize Krishna as the eternal personality of God. What was in his mind? He was thinking, I tried to kill this personality, but it was not possible. He is greater than Garuda, therefore he must be the source of all sources, of my strength even. The moment he started thinking that way, his head became lower. All the anger and envy in his heart started going. This is the greatness of Bhakti. Now one other factor finally helped Kaliya. And that factor was actually his wives. His wives were standing there all that time and they were watching him. Now for a long time the Acharyas tell us that the wives of Kaliya were devotees of the Lord. They were chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 But every time they chanted, Kaliya would not hear. You know, I don't know whether wives here have this experience with their husbands. It may happen. You know, I'm not saying your husbands are Kalias. <laughs> I'm, all I'm saying is that, you know, sometimes, you know, my experience is women by nature are very devotional. 
and they get, they take up Krishna consciousness with the simplicity that is so easy in devotional service. Kunti Mata tells that Prabhupada also says that that is a great advantage of womanhood. But men sometimes we are very caught by this pride and we and we think that we are the proprietors of everything. So Nagapatnis got fed up with their husband. They were thinking all this time we are Krishna conscious. This one doesn't want to change. So when they saw that Krishna was beating him to death by dancing on him, they were in disgust with him and they thought, never mind, let Krishna finish him off. <laughs> However, when he started changing his facial uh, expressions, and you know, wives, you know, we know husbands very well. We know by the face, oh, this one is changing now. It happens. So when they saw that Kalia had changed what was coming from his mouth, from poison to blood, they knew now something was different. And most importantly, Bhagavatam tells us, they saw four characteristics manifesting in Kaliya. And these characteristics are very important for us. The first characteristic they saw was he was becoming humble. No more very proud. After humility, they saw that he was becoming remorseful. So when one becomes humble, then he gets to become remorseful. Remorseful means genuinely he starts feeling that my actions are not very good. From remorse, Kalia exhibited the third quality, and that was regret. R, R, you know, H, humility, R, remorse. Remorse transformed into regret. Remorse is a feeling in the heart. Regret is a feeling which now translates into action. When you are remorseful, you start regretting your previous activities. You don't justify them. That's the, ch that's the difference between remorse an advancement of remorse into regret. So when he started feeling that what I've done is not correct, now his heart was changing. So from humility, when we chant humbly, that's why Trinada Pisuni Chena is so important. When a devotee chants in a humble state of mind, when he tolerates all difficulties, then he regrets, he becomes remorseful of his own nature. He doesn't blame people. Then he regrets his activities. And when he regrets it, then he doubts whether he has been correct or not. So Bhagavatam tells us that humility, remorse, regret, and doubt that we have, that we are the only proprietor, genuine doubt, came into the heart of Kaliya. And when it's established itself in his heart, then they changed their hearts. Now they decided, let's all come forward to Krishna and now let's pray to save our husband. Which wife wants the husband to die? I hope no one. Huh? <laughs> That's good. So in this case, the Nagapatnis were no different. They also did not want Krishna, uh, Krishna to kill uh, uh, Kaliya. So now they come forward with full affection and they start chanting the beautiful prayers that they chanted. Now, my Guru Maharaj told me two of the most sweetest sets of prayers in whole Bhagavatam 10th canto are the prayers of the gopis and the prayers of the Nagapatnis. And this is actually stated by no less an authority than Jiva Goswami himself. So we should take note that when you have time, please study the prayers of the Nagapatnis. For our purposes, we can just understand that the Nagapatnis' main prayer was this. They said, Krishna, you are right to punish an offender. And my, our, husband's, our husband is definitely an offender. In fact, you have come to curb his envious nature. And for that, we thank you. You are so impartial that you look equally upon your enemies as well as your devotees. And in the same way you shower mercy on your devotees, today you have showered mercy even on your enemy Kaliya. And for you, whether you chastise someone or whether you praise them, both chastisement and praise from Krishna are also mercy. So they say that the punishment that you are giving him will purify him. And your anger towards our husband is to be understood as your mercy. See the mood of the Nagapatnis. They understand that the mercy of Krishna does not mean that he should just forgive. They accepted that what Krishna did was correct. And this is what we must do if we want to progress in devotional service. Whatever that comes into our life, there is a difference between a struggling devotee and a pure devotee. A struggling devotee expects that Krishna should make my life in A, B, C. A great devotee accepts that whatever Krishna gives me is A, B, and C. A subtle but a very important difference. A great devotee accepts, a struggling devotee expects. 
Expectation kills, but acceptance liberates. Expectation will drown your mind. Acceptance will free your mind. And that is what the Nagapat needs to Now the prayer shifts. Now they say, if you don't mind me asking you, O oh Krishna, we have been praying to you so long as devotees. What did our husband do? Did he do some great devotional austerities in his past life? Did he remember you so greatly in his past life that today you have actually given him the greatest benediction of touching your lotus feet on his head? Lakshmi ji is praying day and night so that she can touch your lotus feet. And here Kalia never prayed to you one single day. We know it because we are his wife. <laughs> never chanted rounds in the morning, never read Bhagavatam, never did Arati for you, never did anything. And yet today, what has this fellow done that he has got more benediction than all of us put together? How kind you are that you have given this. And then they end by saying, once anyone is touched by you, they will never hanker for anything else. And this is a very important point. That is why Kalia changed his life. Because when he looked up now, he became very, very remorseful. And after Nagaparnis had prayed that way, they ended by saying, Krishna, please spare our husband. Please be merciful. Give him back to us. Because our husband has chaste wives. He is also our life and soul. And now that he's become Krishna conscious, we will be a very nice Krishna conscious family. The moment they have finished chanting, Kalia now looks up. Kalia doesn't have the beauty and poetry of his wives. Because he has been serpent all his life. But he now repeats the same thing that the Nagapatni say. And he offers his obeisances to Krishna. Now Krishna stands up. And in front of the residence of Vrindavan on land, standing while on Kaliya still, Nagapatni is in the water, Krishna now delivers his verdict. Krishna now says that, Kaliya, I banish you from Yamuna. Never come back here again. Take your wives, take the whole family package, leave. But I allow you to go to the furthest ends of the ocean to stay there. And in case you're worried that Garuda is going to come after you because now you're not in the confines of Yamuna, don't worry, I've got that figured out too. <laughs> because I have stepped on you, the imprint of my lotus feet will be on your head. When Garuda is flying from an aerial angle, he will envision you. And the first thing he will see will be the imprints of my feet. And when he sees them with his eyes, he will know that this Kalia is not food. He has now been touched by the Supreme Lord. And unlike you, Garuda hears me and he will not do this. So go and be free and never come here and disturb the Vrindavan residents because they are my life and they are my soul. And that is why I've come. So Krishna was quite strict about it. And Kalia and family, they all leave. And Kalia's life has now changed. The residents of Vrindavan, they come. Krishna swims back and he's embraced by Mother Yashoda. He's embraced by the Gopas. The, go, the cowherd men, you know, and, and Nanda Maharaj, they think, who is this Krishna who could kill this great serpent? Was he none other than Lord Narayana himself? You see, they could not, they could not grasp because of their love for Krishna, that Krishna is the supreme personality of God here. Because if they did, then they would be doing arati for him, isn't it? <laughs> but he didn't want that. He wanted the affectionate love of his devotees. So he wanted them always to think of him as just Krishna. So then they started giving the favorable arguments. You know what? Somehow Lord Narayana, they must have given, he must have given Krishna extra strength. So that somehow or another he got out of the clutches of the Kalia. Kalia became tired. Krishna danced for a while. Kalia let him go. That was it. <laughs> so that way, you know, it's the complete opposite of what happened. But the residents of Vrindavan, by the mercy of Krishna, for them, Krishna was just Krishna. And they went back home and they became very happy. Now the conclusion to this pastime, Sukadeva Goswami gives us three words that we should remember. Krishnena Adbhutaha Karmana. Krishnena Adbhutaha Karmana. And he explains in depth this point. He says that this wonderful activity of the Lord was actually enacted to save and to increase the bhakti of the residents of Vrindavan. Not to subdue Kaliya. It's a very important point. Kaliya was second part. But Krishna always comes to this world to actually heighten the remembrance and to give himself to his devotees. He comes to protect his devotees. 
If I say I come to this world to kill the demons and protect you, there is a slight difference as when I say I come here to protect you and slay the demons. Is it? Subtle but important. Buyo namasad vijane asam. No, vijane, what is that verse? Buyo namasad vijane chide asatam asam bhavaya akila murta sattve. Second canto, fourth chapter, thirteenth verse. Shukadeva Goswami says exactly what Krishna is, being, is saying now. Krishna comes, first of all, not to annihilate the demons. He comes to give himself to the devotees by offering protection of their consciousness more than their life and limb so that they, they will remember Krishna. So our prayer to Krishna is not, Krishna, make me live 100 years. But Krishna, whatever time I have, let me remember you. If it's 100 years, good. But if it's not, better I remember Krishna and die than to live 100 years and forget Krishna. There's no value to that life. So the protection is never for health. Health is going to go anyway. But the protection is consciousness. This is the point of Krishna. The second reason why he comes is that he wanted to purify Kaliya. And this is his greatness. Because Kaliya was demonic in mentality. And Krishna wanted to prove to him that the power of bhakti can overcome any form of demonic mentality. So this is very important for us. This is the greatness of bhakti. We become purified of anger and envy which Kaliya represented when we come in contact with Krishna. That is the greatness of devotional service. That is why we are here. So Krishna bestowed grace upon the victims of the violence of Kaliya and he bestowed grace upon the committer of that violence also who was Kaliya himself. And that is why he is known as Adbhuta. So you know Krishnena, Adbhuta and Karmana. Krishna withdrew both. He, he had this greatness of his activity, Karmana, by withdrawing the sinful activities of Kaliya against Garuda also. This is an important point. And by withdrawing that and allowing him to continue, he actually rid him of his offenses to a devotee. Only Krishna can do that. And the last but very important reason for this pastime is that he came because of the prayers of the wives of Krishna. That is why Prabhu and Mataji, a devotee of the Lord, is more pleasing to the Lord than the Lord himself. When the living entities serve the devotees, Krishna becomes more pleased than even when he is directly served. That is why the shortcut to Krishna is not through our own endeavors. The shortcut to Krishna is by serving a devotee of the devotee of the devotee of Krishna. Because Kaliya somehow or another remembered how his wives remembered Krishna and how his wives were always trying to pray to Krishna, that stock of devotional service actually rubbed off on Kaliya in a very subtle way. And because of their prayers, Krishna finally relented. So we should never think that our prayers are very powerful. But we should have the humility to know that a devotee's prayers on our behalf will always be heard by Krishna. If we have all this mood very nicely put, then the pastime of Kaliya becomes so significant in our lives. Jai Grantaraj Shri Jai Shri La Prabhupada Ki Jai Shri La Guru Dev Ki Jai Itai Gaura Prema Are there any questions? Atma Prabhu? No, I have a question. Sure, Prabhu. So, I mean, you beautifully uh, talked about the Kaliya Nantra. There's another instance where Lord Krishna, in the form of Vishnu Mahavishnu, sleeps on the snake Adishesha. So, so what's the kind of relationship? Or, I mean, Adishesha is different, correct? And then what's the background of Adishesha? Nice point. Adishesha, Prabhu, is actually non-different from Lord Balaram. Okay. When Lord Vishnu lies down, Lord Balaram comes in the form of Anantasesh. Because Lord Balaram is like the elder brother and the first expansion of Krishna. His duty like an elder brother, loving elder brother, is that wherever my younger brother goes, I want to serve him. So when Lord comes in the form of Vishnu, he has to lie down to create the universe. To lie down Anantasesh, Lord Balaram says, please lie down on me. And that is his greatness. When Lord came in the form of Lord Ram, Lord Balram came as Lakshman 
And Lakshman said, wherever you go, I will serve you and follow you. And when the Lord comes now in the form of Krishna, the Lord says, you have served me all this time. So this time you become my elder brother. So as an elder brother, I will also be able to serve you. So Ananta Sesh actually represents Lord Balram. And therefore, Lord Balram is the essence of all service, Prabhu. So even Kartals, for example, that we play, the Mridanga that we play, all these items of musical instrument also are all representations of Lord Balram. They are all considered representations of Lord Balram. Because we chant Krishna's name, Lord Balram wants to be involved in that activity. So he comes in the form of instruments so that he can also participate in Kirtan. So that is the philosophical basis, in a nutshell, of Balram's position. You know, he's Adi Guru. His duty is to bring us to the lotus feet of Krishna. And that is why if we pray to Lord Balram for Balram, which is strength, Bala, then what happens is Lord Balram will give us spiritual strength to actually counter the difficulties of life. So the Nagas here, the serpents, they belong to a race of serpents. So their relationship were, is different from that of Balram. By nature, normally snakes tend to be a bit harsh. They are also a bit angry and envious. They can strike. And when that happens, that nature is embodied very much also in our nature. So Kaliya belonged to a race of serpents who had that nature. But Balram is a separate category altogether because he is completely transcendent. But he takes a certain form like Ananda Sesh. And that's why as Ananda Sesh, he can hold this entire material universe up as he's doing actually, even now. Is that helpful to you? Perfect, thanks. Thank you. Atma Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu, thank you so much for that wonderful class. Um, one thing I was thinking about, it seems like there's a difference, obviously there's a difference between the demoniac personalities back then and the who are called atheists in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada calls them atheists, and then the atheists now. Whereas like people like Kaliya and you know Hiranyakashipu, they almost they knew that Vishnu existed and they knew that he was supposed to be the supreme power, but they just didn't accept. Yes. So it seems like so therefore when they go through these experiences, then they can realize okay this is that person. Yes. Yes. Whereas the people we deal with now, they don't even believe that person exists. So it yes. feels like no matter what they go through, they don't come to that same realization. Yes. Is there any difference that we can in, in terms of? giving the people now who have no reference point to anything supreme, yes. like a chance? Yes. You know. Oh yes, Prabhu. There's plenty of chance for those who are atheistic in this age. But having said that, I would agree with you that the demons, the greatest demons in Bhagavatam were very great. They were very powerful. But they knew that there was a personality who was supreme. And therefore they envied him very much. The atheist Prabhupada says, actually is not so far away. The atheist in his heart, even if he doesn't want to accept the Supreme, he then also advances the other argument, that even if someone or something claims to be Supreme, he is not. So in that sense, his argument is not very far off from a demon who says, well, Krishna thinks he's Supreme, but I don't accept it. So the atheist actually does that also, except that he thinks that his denial will keep him forever away from Krishna. So in that sense, Vedic culture then was better even amongst the demons. <laughs> and Vedic culture today, you know, is so bad. But having said that, I find that if you, if you want to introduce Krishna consciousness to those who do not believe in God, the best way to introduce it to them is on the basis of our behavior. If our behavior is godly, then even if they don't accept God, most atheists accept good behavior. In fact, many atheists come to the point of atheistic feelings because they have seen people claiming to be God worshippers but behaving so badly. And that's normally the impetus for them to say God is dead. But when they see someone who doesn't push God into their mouths but who instead just tries very hard to be the best person that he can be, then in behavior Bhagavatam is already there. And anyone who takes any of the behaviors of the devotees and just behaves himself or herself you'll find that behavior of devotional character is such a strong magnet for anyone in the world, whether they believe God or whether they don't. And when they become attracted to such a personality, they don't realize that Krishna has transcendently cheated them. Because by becoming attracted to a devotee, 
Krishna actually starts cleaning their hearts. They become attracted to behavior. They don't realize behavior is coming from Bhagavatam. So you put logic together, they're actually attracted to Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is Krishna. Behavior is Krishna. So they don't realize that actually they are actually related and attracted to Krishna. And in that way, Krishna can change the heart of even the most hardcore atheist. So that is our practical experience. And I think Prabhupada did that to many of us. Many of the people who came to Prabhupada were so disillusioned that that's why they decided, let's give up everything and find a different purpose to life. And Prabhupada gave them life because of his simplicity, his purity, and his loving dealings. If you speak to many senior disciples of Prabhupada, or people, or devotees, or anyone who met Prabhupada, they were more attracted to who Prabhupada was than to what Prabhupada said. And I think that was always the key point of any devotee. So I hope that is useful, Prabhu, for us to understand it. It's a good question. Anything else? Yes, Mataji. Thank you so much for a wonderful class. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Yes. One is, um, in the example of Kaliya, he's extreme. So he's extremely evil in some ways. Yes. Um, what I find is that in our dealings, we kind of delude ourselves. You know, for example, we are in the past Krishna consciousness. So you can assume that we are, you know, if not free, but mostly good. Yeah, somewhere between Kalia and his wife. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that is the, when it is really extreme, it can be seen, and then Krishna's mercy is also there. Yes. When it is in this muddy place, yes. then it is harder. That was one question, and I'll also tell you the other question. Um, so you mentioned earlier about self-satisfaction. Yes. And I think uh, my, my uh, sort of doubt is that Self-satisfaction can also hide a complacency, and so how to... Yeah, how to know what is where. Your first point is actually a statement, and I would agree with you that many of us are in that position where, hopefully, we are not in the extremities of Kaliya. By Krishna's mercy, we have come out of that. At least we accept Krishna. But having said that, Bhagavatam also tells us that while the, while the qualities of envy and anger may have been diminished by the greatness of devotional service, they do take subtle forms. Okay. And very often we may not see them. But the manifestation of their subtlety and the fact that they exist will be actually seen in the fact that we are still disturbed when we do our devotional service. We are not consistent. And that is reason why we should first not be discouraged because we know who we were. We all know in our hearts, touching our hearts, we know where we were and how Krishna has taken us from there. So instead of becoming discouraged that we are still muddy, we should have faith based on the shlokas we spoke about, that that cleansing process is continuing. And as long as we stick to the process, and as you said now, and this is where your other point comes in, that we always are in a position where we are not satisfied with who we are as devotees but we are very satisfied with what we receive as human beings. If we have that distinction in our life, then self-satisfaction and complacency, they become compartmentalized easier. In other words, there should be, there should be things we should never be satisfied with. Our Guru Mahaj always said three things you should never be satisfied with. What are they? First is? Chanting. We should never be satisfied with our chanting. Meaning to say, we should never think, I'm chanting really nice. You know, it's dangerous if someone comes up, Prabhupada asked one devotee, so how is your devotional life? And he said, very nice. He asked the next devotee, how is your devotional life? And he said, Prabhupada, I'm struggling. And Prabhupada said, this is very nice. <laughs> he said, this is very nice. Why? Because a devotee, when it comes to devotional service, he never genuinely believes that he is alright because he knows that there's so much improvement. So he never comes to a point where he thinks, my chanting is fine, that's it. Because chanting is the means and the goal, it is an ever-increasing ocean of bliss. So he just tries to always be humble about his chanting genuinely. So chanting we should now be satisfied with. What's the second one? Reading, scriptures. Reading and studying of scriptures. Sastras tell us the second thing we should now be satisfied with is actually the reading of scriptures. We should not think, I've read Bhagavatam one time, Hari Bol. I know everything. I've read Bhagavad Gita, what else is there to read? I've read all Prabhupada's books, now I'm done. That satisfaction is complacency. In fact, we should know that Brahma Sparshanam means daily we have to touch Krishna. 
then only we are purified. The moment we don't touch Krishna, the material modes come. So we have to keep touching him. Therefore, we must keep chanting and we must keep reading. What's the third thing we should never be satisfied with? Charity. Charity. Charity means that we should never be satisfied with the fact that we think we have given enough to Krishna and enough in service. Sometimes we think, I've done enough. 20 years of serving Krishna, Haribo, now I'm retired. No. A devotee, there's no such word as retirement for a devotee. Never. So, charity means we never stop giving if it's a cause for Krishna either. We don't feel that. Whatever we have earned is not ours to keep. It's ours to give back to Krishna. So these three things Sastra say we should not be satisfied with. And if we are not satisfied with this, Mataji, it means we are still self-satisfied, we are not complacent. But Sastras tell us there are three things we should be satisfied with. What is the first thing? Wife. Wife. <laughs> or husband, depending on which side you are. We should be satisfied with whatever Krishna gives us as husband or wife. Because the moment we are not satisfied with our wife or husband, then our devotional service is very difficult. Very difficult. So we should be always we should always be peaceful. Otherwise, very often devotees say, you know, this wife is not up to the mark, that husband is not up to the mark. Nobody is up to the mark because we ourselves are not up to the mark. This is our problem. And it's very hard. Every time Maharaj used to tell us, you know, even though we are married, still we look at other people and think, oh, if I was married to her, she looks like a nice person. <laughs> I remember one devotee came to Maharaj and said, Maharaj, I'm always dreaming, you know, that before I got married, I saw five girls as part of arranged marriage. I chose a choice number four. But daily I'm thinking since 20 years, what happened if I choose if I chose number one, two, three? said, you're finished, man. Mahara said, thank God the others escaped you. So that's the first thing we should be satisfied with. What's the second thing we should be satisfied with? Food. Food, right? Whatever that comes to our plate, we should be satisfied. So after this, whatever prasadam comes, you please be satisfied. I'm sure they cooked a lot, but even then be satisfied. Prasadam shouldn't be, yeah? that's Balram Prabhu's point. <laughs> take it, I won't argue with him, he is Balram <laughs> And what's the third thing we should not be satisfied Income. with? Huh? Income. Earning? Not satisfied? Earning. Oh, right, sorry, we should be satisfied with income. Whatever comes, we should remember, the source of income is not the source of maintenance. This is a statement that Prabhupada gives in Chaitanya Charitamrita, in the episode of Murigari, the hunter. The source of income is not the source of maintenance. Very deep point. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada says in very simple language, source of income is you. You earn, therefore money is coming. Mm -hmm. But you are not maintaining yourself. The source of your maintenance, of your sustenance is him. So we may earn, but he is only maintaining us. With all the money in the world, tomorrow we get a heart attack, it's finished. Mm -hmm. So source of income is never the source of maintenance. That is why devotees don't worry about income. We know that if we are serving Krishna, whatever is coming to our plate, He will arrange. And if nothing is on our plate, Haribo. That's also alright. So if we live this way, Mataji, then complacency on one side, self-satisfaction on the other side, it becomes clearer. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you, sir. So should we chant for a few minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Two more questions, or someone has another? She asked the question. Is there a question? Yeah. Question group. Yes, bro. Yes. You you said that this is the first time he's ever asked a question. So. <laughs> I guess yeah, clapping is the best thing to do. <laughs> yeah, you said that from pride comes envy. From envy comes anger. When Bhagavad Gita 262 Krishna says, from attachment on the sense object comes lust, and from lust comes anger. So so how does pride, envy, lust and anger fit into the equation? From when when you become attached to something that doesn't belong to you, you become proud of it. Okay. If you think about it, when we become attached to something, we start thinking that it belongs to us. The moment we think it, it belongs to us, that attachment actually brings forth subtle pride. When the pride is there, and in between the pride, 
when we are proud of something, if we think that what we have is better than what someone else has, and when that person has something which is better than ours, and we are proud of what we have, and we are challenged by it, that challenge turns to envy. And when there is envy, then the natural result of envy is we, we don't know how to express our frustration, Mm -hmm. And when we try to acquire something beyond what is already there for us, it turns into anger. So actually, the sequence that Bhagavad Gita gives, and the sequence of pride, envy and anger that is given by Bhagavatam in the 7th canto, 15th chapter, they actually exist harmoniously because they fill in the spaces. Mm -hmm. But it starts with attachment. Mm -hmm. to, to When your senses become attached to an object, all these characteristics will come. And that is why Krishna over and over again in Bhagavad Gita tells us that please understand that you are not the proprietor of everything, that everything finally belongs to him. If we can try to understand that or try to do that, then Prabhu, this pride, envy, attachment, lust, which is actually, a comp uh, uh, lust is actually comprised of all three. When you become lusty after something, naturally you are proud because you think I'm lusting after something because I deserve it. We always run after something because we think it should come to us. We will never run after something if we genuinely believe it doesn't belong to us. Why am I running after it? So, so what comes first, lust or pride? In fact, when the word lust is used, it comes because you are asking for something which cannot be obtained. If you are asking for something that cannot be obtained but you think it belongs to you, then actually they exist at the same level. Okay. They actually exist at the same level. Mm -hmm. It is because of your lust that you have become very proud. And your pride sustains your lust. You see? Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice question, very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you keep asking questions. <laughs> sure. Guru, I was just uh, wanting to share something about, uh, I mean, when you're say when you're talking about Kalia and, this, and the Nagapatni prayers, um, I was just uh, thinking about uh, uh, Maharaj quite a bit, and it is interesting that that you said about. Um, I was just um, you you were almost uh, you know you present Kalia as a very stubborn person who thing, and I was thinking of my own stubbornity, and I, I remember mentioning to this, this to Maharaj one day in Rajkot. I told Maharaj that somehow, you know, I don't want to be a devotee, I don't care to be a devotee, but kicking and screaming literally pulling me to be a devotee. I mean, and um, and the way he almost, you know, like you said, you know, that, that Krishna, you know, on one hand he was chastising Kali, on the other hand he was increasing the devotion of the residents of Vrindavan. Yes. And I was thinking that uh, Maharaj had this speciality that um, uh, he had a way of making you attached to him in such a way that even if you didn't want to become a devotee, you had to become one. Almost, I mean, he almost was, you know, pulling you towards that. So I just thought I'd just share that. that as I find it very amusing about that kicking and screaming that you know he did. Uh, that and it's not only Mahavishnu uh, Maharaj directly, but I'm talking of the devotees generally that they have this tendency of you know almost for nature. Then devotees have this nature of almost you know we don't want to be devotees, but they're kicking and screaming. We get pulled by them, and sometimes it can be very uh, like you said. Uh, can be very painful yes. because we feel that why are you not you know letting me have my space and my this thing why are you so much in my life yes. uh, that you know I can't breathe I can't think you're almost you know like a thing yes. but uh, that is the mercy of the devotees yes. that they almost you know they they are just trying to take the poison and convert it into blood yes. in you very true very the devotees and in doing so they sweat gallons of their own blood right just to give us this Krishna consciousness yeah. how true and that is true of all the great devotees, yes. right Prabhu? In Bhagavatam, in our movement, we find all great devotees, they give so much of themselves, even though we give so little back. Yeah. And we resist so much. And despite all that, they never become discouraged with us. They always continue to be patient with us, kind to us, considerate with us. That is the greatness of devotees. Which is why devotees are considered even more merciful than even, um, than even Krishna. That's true. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, you, when you finish the Kaliya Nadra, you talk about four points, humility, remorse, regret, yes. and finally doubt. doubt. Yes. So when, you're, when you have humility, you get subdued, uh, and then you are feeling regretful, 
you are like uh, thinking of all the pops you have done. Yes. What's the doubt factor? The doubt factor is all the things that you thought um, were actually yours to keep. Your acquisitions, the ideas that you have had, that materially I will live forever. All the ideas that you have been so convinced about. When devotional service comes, then you begin to have genuine doubt about the, the, the permanent nature of this material world, which is untrue. You start doubting over the yes. whole wise you talked about yesterday. Yes, exactly. Then that doubt is a healthy doubt. Okay. Because otherwise, till then, we have been very convinced that we will live forever. We are so convinced that material nature is best. But once devotional service comes, then it replaces that idea. Then when our doubts come, by Krishna consciousness and by nice purification of this process, this doubt of, I'm now not the only uh, permanent thing in the world, it is actually instilled in the heart. And when that happens, Prabhu, then what happens is a devotee increases his faith in Krishna. So that is why this doubt is not the doubt that Krishna exists or not. This is the doubt that all this time I thought I was Krishna, but now I am seriously doubtful. After Krishna has been stepping on my head all this time, I think I am not Krishna. And neither am I anywhere close to being as strong as Krishna. It's a very nice point. Okay, we'll end here. Maybe we chant for a few minutes. Why is this lighter note? Yes, thank you. So, request to all the masters is that they need to chant more like Nagapatmi so that we can get That's an interesting request. Okay, so. Manka Prabhu's request to all the wives is that you all become Nagapatis. And we are accepting your... Uh, yeah. That's the point. <laughs> I, because all your husbands by default are Kaliyas. <laughs> Therefore, his point is that all wives should pray very hard, you know, that somehow the husbands should put their head down before Krishna starts stepping on them. Point noted, Prabhu. <laughs> nice point. <laughs> they like to be happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Hare Krishna 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 Hare
महाराज की sincerity and their hard work and i think many of us somehow or another have been touched by krishna through the mercy of their hard work so there is something that we should always bear in mind without the mercy of devotees it is not possible to make sweet advancement in krishna consciousness i wish you all the best today i fly so krishna willing we will see each other again our meetings are not accidents you know they are actually arrangements of krishna we should never make these programs into rituals that we just come and we go and it is very auspicious real auspiciousness is when we change our lives there must be a reason why we have come together and there must be a way for us to somehow or another fix our mind on krishna be determined always be in the association of devotees and never forget that devotional service is meant to make us smile If you cannot smile while being a devotee, something is seriously wrong with you. Sometimes we work so hard in devotional service, and we forget how to smile. But remember, the point of devotional service is: don't smile when you think you've reached your goal. The goal in devotional service is the same as the means. We always forget that. I will chant and chant and struggle in my life, and I go back to Krishna. I'll smile. <laughs> no, when we chant, we are with Krishna. Therefore. Please relish the moment that is before you. Don't miss it. That's the point. That's why many devotees become fried because they've forgotten how to smile when they chant. Very important. When we do kirtan, we should not become impersonalists. When we look at each other during kirtan, we should smile at <coughs> each other. Sometimes when we have kirtans, you know, when we see each other, we are scared. <laughs> he chants like he's going to kill me or he's going to kill me. What is wrong with smiling? Of course, I tell devotees when we are chanting and we smile, make sure that men smile to men. <laughs> I have a prabhu. I have a complaint from Mataji in my congregation. This prabhu is smiling at all the Mataji. <laughs> After a while, it was very difficult to chant. So we encourage you to smile, but please smile at the right people. Jai Gurudeva Shri Madhavatam Ki. So I want to thank everybody for coming uh, and joining us on this occasion. I also want to thank, on behalf of the Minneapolis congregation, the. Uh, Dev Ki Nandan Prabhu for making time to come to visit Minneapolis, and uh, you know as we have all experienced in the last few days, I'm sure a lot of Krishna Katha, the essence of it is going to be of how we adopt it in our lives after he leaves. <laughs> Not while he's around, it's easy to you know it's easy to be Krishna conscious when the devotees are around, but uh, once we leave, once they leave, you know. Then uh, we go back to our modes of nature. So the real, the real uh, association is when he leaves. <laughs> if we are, if we are uh, taken some even one message, we have been uh, this whole weekend. It's very nice to see that devotees have you know taken so much time off uh, to come to all the programs and everything, that and all the all the effort that has been put in all the programs. And, uh, it's amazing the level of you know what just a few devotees can do, and it's but it's important that we should carry this message. There was a time, just on the side note, uh, you know, when Kanapuri Maharaj used to visit Minneapolis, he would come here for about two weeks uh, every six months, and I remember those two weeks he would come for. Uh, it would be so intense uh, that you know, literally, my mail would pile up. 
for those 15 days that he was there. I couldn't even, I, still half, uh, half my, huh? Still <laughs> still up. Yeah, still up. That's true. <laughs> that, that I would, I would not be able to, pay. I mean, half my bills were overdue and not paid and all that because I was so, you know, and, and Tarun Mataji remembers, you know, cooking for a university program. So we, she would make the halwa, we would make the kitchen and, and things like that. That used to be the times when... Uh, he doesn't shave also, bro. Huh? You don't shave also. Yeah, don't shave also. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that used to be quite a quite an intense uh, period, you know, and morning, evening, morning, evening, every day of the week, not just only weekend, every day of the week. After two weeks, we would have programs. But then, the thing is, the interesting thing is, after he left, the energy that, the spiritual experience, the energy that we, the batteries that we charge, would carry us for another six months when he would come back. So it was a nice routine that we had. <laughs> so hopefully, so, uh, six months. Yeah. So so anyway, so six, six months. So so you know, there's a request here. There's a request here. <laughs> I, I was thinking that you should invite Vishwanath the Maharaj during winter. You should come. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired of it. This is too hot, you know. Yeah, I actually wanted to be cold. January is best. But I'll tell you one thing. Devotional service also, it also helps the devotees who appear to be speaking. Because it also nourishes our devotional service. So it's not one way. I'm equally inspired by the devotees. And I hope this will help me to increase my own devotion. This is unity. And we put aside everything else and we put Krishna in the center. And in that loving relationship, anything is solvable. Nothing is an impediment. We are so strong because Krishna is so pleased that we are all just serving each other. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So Deshmi Ramdhan Prabhu is here through the day uh, and uh, his flight is at uh, what, 6 in the evening? Yes, 6 in the evening. Six. So Six. we'll have to leave at four from here. So anyway, anyway, after Prasad, if anybody wants to have some association, and, and we will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So after which, which, which way is better? Because if the momentum is that we are here and I sit. Yeah, I don't. The other way is I can actually go with him at the end part of the day. Or you can go and come back, I guess. Uh, anyway, we'll just yeah. discuss it out. Like.